So today we continue with more about uh, onset clusters. And I'm just gonna start by, you know, uh, reminding you kind of where we are in the overall presentation. So these are the, uh, the pre-initials that Baxter and Cigar reconstruct, and they come in loose and tight forms. And last time I discussed the kind of overall plausibility for reconstructing pre-initials, both in terms of, you know, that there, that there isn't that much evidence, but there's some quite good evidence like these, these, these words written with two characters and so on. Uh, and then we looked at uh, reconstructing uh, tight pre-initials using Sheshang evidence. In particular, uh, we only looked at the S prefix, which you will be happy to know is the one that, you know, um, I don't know, that comes up the most. So now today uh, we will look at reconstructing tight pre-initials using Sheshang evidence, but for P, for K, and for T, and, and M and capital N, uh, and uh, unspecified C, which of course is the same thing as P, K, P, K or T, but, but <clears throat> when we can't tell which one it is. Okay, so now we're gonna start in on that, which is we're looking at uh, Sheshan evidence for tight pre-initial P. Here it goes. So uh, in you know, pointing to a, a, a change of, of uh, a sort of reduction of PK to P in tight, uh, in, sorry, in tight B syllables uh, is this Sheshang series. So you see we have a, uh, a connection between a initial P in one word and an initial K in another word. And actually I would even, you know, go further and say the, the initial P word is being used as the phonetic in the initial K word. So in order to make the Sheshang hypothesis work, you, you either need to argue that the first word kind of secretly has an initial K, which is what Baxter and Cigar have done, or you would have to argue that the, uh, the second word uh, secretly has an initial P. And I just want to emphasize that like the, 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 the thing that I'm trying to get across uh, right now is that uh, these problems are real, right? Like how to reconstruct the old Chinese of these two um, of, of, of these two characters in order to make the Sheshang hypothesis work is a real problem uh, that you can either ignore or you can try to solve. And if you try and solve it, you could do the way Baxter and Cigar are doing, but uh, but um, you could try other ways, right? So uh, also I would say when I see P and K uh, connections. You can also think about reconstructing labiovelars, but you know we've already reconstructed labiovelars for something else, and 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 so on. Which is to say, I think that you know there. Uh, I want to emphasize that that it's not like we should take um, uh, Baxter and Cigar's reconstruction as as the only solution. But I think it is a very good uh, reconstruction in terms of telling us which things we need solutions for and offering possibilities for them. Okay, so uh, continuing on. Here uh, we have, um, you know, so P, so P, Q, H, uh, leading to to aspirated P in type A syllables, and you'll notice that uh, that these patterns are much more gappy than we saw for for the S prefix, which is to say, basically, there are specific circumstances in which Baxter Cigar think there are evidence for reconstructing these uh, things, but uh, there are probably a lot of them if. If we agree with their analysis of old Chinese phonotactics, there are probably a lot of cases of these pre-initials that have not been uh, discovered. Okay, so yeah, so we have a connection between an aspirated P and a voiceless velar fricative. As you know, the voiceless velar fricatives generally come from uvulars, so this is their solution. Yeah, and then uh, here's uh, another one. So uh, this is, you know, P uh, voices R changes to pH, uh, and the Sheshen connection is between this aspirated uh, retroflex stop and a, a, a pH. So there you go. And that was it for the pre-initial P using Sheshen evidence. And now on to pre-initial K using Sheshen evidence. 
So we have kla goes to ka in type A syllables. Ka, I should have said, without aspiration. And here, once again, I just I just uh, include the, the pre-chin form of a character so that you can more obviously see that there is a Sheshan connection between these characters. So we have, yeah, we have uh, a K initial, and then we have a typical lateral series so that you can see, okay, yeah, we have a, 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 we have a voice dental, and we have a voiceless dental, and we have the ya. So it's a classic kind of lateral series, but then it has this, this ka initial kind of intruding. So how do we deal with that? Well, why not uh, reconstruct a cl uh, cluster? Okay. They appear not to give any uh, examples of the sound change in type B syllables. Okay, now kr goes to k, and we have an L initial, which we reconstruct back to R, and then a KH. Uh, so their solution is K uh, before a uh, voiceless R. Okay, and they appear not to give any examples of the sound change in type B syllables. Now, this one is a little bit... Um, I don't know, finicky. So they think that a K before a glottal stop changed to K. I'm not quite sure, you know, I'm not a, 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 a phonetician. I'm not quite sure how this would end up getting realized, this K glottal stop. Uh, and maybe it's, there's no problem there, you tell me. But uh, it seems a little strange to me. In any case, they normally reconstruct a series that shows Sheshan connections between velars and glottals, as you have already seen as deriving from inherited uvulars. But they also permit uh, this K before glottal as an alternative explanation, explanation of such Sheshung series. So here it, it feels like we're getting a little bit sort of not in keeping with Occam's razor, right? If we have one solution for um, uh, glottal stop velar interchange in Sheshung series, why don't we just use that one solution? What's the motivation for this second solution? Well, here's the uh, the series that they use it for. So you see uh, the series, you know, so you have a, a glottal initial and a K initial. Um, and it appears to be they they uh, they prefer not to have two Sheshang series that write the same type of old Chinese syllable. And um, this is something that they, I think they're hesitant about, so they don't, kind of uh, stated in a very doctrinaire way, but basically as they've worked over the years with these different uh, uh, hypotheses and their interactions, you basically end up with very few Sheshang series indicating the same syllable type. And you can imagine this, uh, just think of something like uh, dentals, right? You might have a series that looks like it represents something like doc, but actually some of those docs will, will go back to an L because L in type A syllable becomes a D. And some of those docs will actually go back to a, a D. So if you have you know, two Shechung series that look like they are structured around doc, maybe one is actually lock and one is actually doc. Uh, so you know, as we kind of um, apply these various interacting hypotheses to uh, the various Shechung series, you start to get a picture that basically each each phonetic determiner uh, serve to index a specific uh, syllable type. So put it in other words, that the Chinese script at, at one point in its history was basically a syllabary. So I think that's one reason why they invoke this uh, hypothesis is that they end up with two uh, Sheshang series that seem to indicate the same syllable, so they um, so they say, well, maybe this one was actually uh, a, a K prefix to a glottal stop. But I don't quite know. They or let's say, what do I know? What do I not know? It definitely, Baxter and Cigar have been moving towards this syllabary idea, although they don't state it very categorically in in their 2014 book. Um, and uh, it is one of the arguments that they invoke in this specific case. But whether or not, generally speaking, that's what motivates this reconstruction, I can't say. By, by positing uh, a tight pre-initial K before a glottal stop is one of the origins of Middle Chinese K. Uh, in, uh, in this uh, case, 
we can understand uh, this series as encode, coding a shape like Godstop UJ, as opposed to this other series that is on the slide, which, which encodes syllables of the type QUJ. Yeah. So we're looking at the second series, the QUJ series. In this series, readings uh, with the voiceless velar uh, fricative and with the ya mean it really has to be uh, reconstructed as a uvula, right? So yeah, so to, to just put the argument the other way around, this series has to be QUJ. So then this series, they think, well, let's look for another solution. How about Glon stop UJ with a K prefix. So that was it for tight pre-initial K using Sheshang evidence. And now we move on to tight pre-initial T using Sheshang evidence. So uh, here is Tkra uh, turning into Tra. Uh, and then I, I generally don't put meanings on any of this stuff because it's I don't know, it's not helpful, right? I mean, it might be helpful in terms of uh, remembering the partic particular case, but I think it sort of adds a lot of clutter. So I haven't been doing it, but I will point out that the first of these means uh, elbow and the second one means nine. And um, and both of these have very good uh, cognates in uh, Sino-Tibetan languages. Um, and you can see, you know, that, uh, that also the, that the, the character for nine in the ancient uh, script, kind of, uh, I think, uh, is a picture of an elbow, if I remember correctly. So there's, so there's clearly they thought there was some kind of, you know, elbow and nine sound is similar. Uh, so, uh, so there you go. There's the evidence for a, a T prefix using Cheshun series. Okay, and then in uh, uh, in this case we have t k k changes to ch. Uh, and here's, uh, you know, some a, ve a velar and a palatal that are linked in the Cheshun series. So they think, well, maybe the, the velar is uh, the initial and the T that gave rise to the palatal is a pre-initial. Here's basically the same thing, but with an R uh, medial. So it becomes a retroflex, uh, an aspirate uh, retroflex stop uh, from the kr. And you see that uh, basically it's a pretty clearly velar series, but then there's this one retroflex at the end. That was it for T pre-initial using Sheshung series. So you see that there's really not nearly as many cases to go through for uh, P, K, and T as there was for S. But now uh, just a comment about resonance, uh, which is that, uh, so, so this one slide has pre-initial, type pre-initial P, T, and K before resonance. And in this case, their argument always comes from the fact that a character itself has two different readings. Now, generally speaking, uh, if a character has two different readings, it's, it seems likely that what's going on is some kind of dialect split and then and then a merging of, um, of readings in, in, let's say, the reading tradition. Um, so, um, yeah, so here are the, are the cases you see. We have uh, one character that can be pim or lim, so that maybe means it goes back to prim. Uh, and then uh, chip and nep, so maybe tna, yeah. And then, and then quet um, and, uh, and mye, so uh, well, so these, these differ also in tone, yeah. Uh, let's say you, you might see a complication in the coda and it, and don't worry about it. Uh, we'll get to it later. It, it, the codas are fine. Um, okay, so that's it for tight stop pre-initials before resonance. Okay. Now, how about tight nasal pre-initials M and N? So, so far we've only looked at uh, P, K, and T or K, P, and T. So on the basis of Sheshang evidence, uh, the tight pre-initials M and N before obstruents are not easily distinguished from each other, which is why I'm treating them together. And they're also not, 
distinguishable from simplex voice resonance. Nonetheless, they can be isolated uh, before uvulars and before R. And, um, and M is identifiable on the basis of shishing evidence before labial nasals. So let me just uh, say kind of what we're not going to see, which is there might be things like an M before a T, yes? Um, but an M before a T would have led to a D in Middle Chinese, and a D is allowed to interchange with a T in a Sheisheng series. So kind of by the very nature of a Sheisheng series, we are not going to be able to see prefix M and N uh, with kind of most stops uh, uh, in, on, on the basis of Sheisheng evidence. That's the, the point that I'm trying to make here which is to say, I'm only gonna show certain kinds of examples, but those are the only examples we would expect to see. Yeah, okay, so M and uh, capital N before some uvulars. Okay, so we have um, a classic uvular series because we've got a velar and we've got a ya and we've got a glottal. Oh, but look, we've also got a velar nasal. How do we explain the velar nasal? Well, it's the first thing on the slide, and you see that basically it could be a lot of things, but all of them would be some kind of nasal prefix followed by some kind of uvular. And I've written out all the options to just make this point that like Baxter and Cigar will reconstruct this word a particular way because they will have other ideas about etymological relationships and, and loans into other languages. But from Sheisheng series, alone in their system, you can say that it's some kind of uh, uh, nasal prefix followed by a uvular. We can also see evidence of the nasal prefix uh, in their system uh, it, before uh, R, actually in old Chinese, leading to uh, a, a ya uh, in middle Chinese. Uh, and I am going to give you this example, which is two readings of the same character. So one with a, a ya and one with a la, yeah, in Middle Chinese. And then just remember that Middle Chinese L goes back to R and Middle Chinese ya, well, can go back to various things, including L and uh, uvulars. Uh, but in this case, they say, well, we, we, we want some kind of explanation for maybe how an R changed into uh, a ya. Uh, and so their explanation is that a nasal prefix before an R uh, changed into a lateral, changed into ya. Uh, connections between ya and la in Middle Chinese, uh, they see as evidence for uh, a na or a ma prefix before a ra in Old Chinese. Yeah, and you know it's another case where you have two readings of the same character, which they take as evidence for dialect developments. And here's what they propose, is that in one dialect, MR develops similarly to L, which is what you already saw in the example I discussed. So the, uh, here's an example of this ying from mra and this mreng from mra. Uh, and then in another dialect, MR merges with M. But it seems to me that reconstructing let's say MR with the medial R and uh, M as a pre-initial before R already indexes these different outcomes. So, so I'm not really sure you know, why they need to um, propose different dialect developments. Uh, although it kind of, this gets back to the question of how do we think MR and M dot R were pronounced differently. So, so let's say, it, you know, if, that's not different, right? If, 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 if the difference between a pre-initial and an initial is neutralized before R because R can serve as a glide, well, then maybe you do need the dialect difference. So I just want to sort of flag that problem and think it through. So now uh, an M pre-initial in a predominantly nasal series from another point of articulation. So just talking you through this example, the, the Sheisheng series actually sees a connection between nya, nga, and ma, but nya is a, a very normal uh, type uh, 
B development from Nga, uh, so we don't worry about it. So basically, we, it, it seems like the series overall has a Nga initial, but then there's this Ma example. And, um, and they reconstruct that with an M prefix. Now, here's a good uh, case for me to, to just give you a sense of, uh, you know, a, a possible alternative approaches. So Chris Beckwith, uh, who unfortunately hasn't, you know, there's no sort of Beckwith system. He just sort of comes by and says a few ideas here and there. He thinks um, that series like this should all be reconstructed with an M initial and that under certain phonetic conditions, M changed to, 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 an, to another nasal. Uh, uh, in this case, Nga, or in other cases, Nga. Um, and, uh, and he you know, tries to formulate some kind of sound change that, that would account for that. Each of these surprising Sheshung connections could in principle be argued the other way. Okay, and then here's, a, here's an example uh, with the Nga initial. So we have a, a clear Nga series. Uh, but then there's a ma initial that's sort of interfering in it. So they reconstruct that spectrum cigar, uh, a, a tight M pre-initial before the na. So now turning to tight pre-initials before uvulars as a source for middle Chinese velars. I may have misstated this in another lecture and taken them back to loose pre-initials, which is an idea that Baxter and Cigar toyed with before the 2014 book, I think in, in 2012. Uh, but in any case, here it goes. Here we have a classic uvular series, right? There's a glottal initial and a ya and a velar. Well, now uh, when I've previously presented these things, I've sort of uh, said, oh, don't pay attention to the velars. The velars are a reason that we're reconstructing a uvular initial in this series, but uh, let's not worry about where they come from. Well, what uh, Baxter and are do is they propose that there's some kind of tight uh, pre-initial stop, right? Because we, we've already seen that a ma and na would have led to a voiced, a voiced uh, velar nasal onset, right? Uh, so instead we're getting a, a velar stop. Uh, so either this would be a ta prefix, a pa prefix, or a ka prefix in their formulation. Uh, and that's how they reconstruct velars that interrupt uh, uvular series. And then similarly, if there's a medial R, and similarly, if there's aspiration, uh, I'll just say that it, it, for this one, uh, don't let it confuse you that there's this uh, capital N before a Q that's based on evidence other than the Sheshang evidence. For our purposes at the moment, you could imagine that as a capital G. Okay, and then, uh, you know, just another example. Yeah, so, so uh, velar, uh, let's say velar stop, velar fricative connections, they uh, reconstruct as uvulars. And we've already discussed that, that the aspirate uvular is the source of the voiceless velar fricative. Well, here uh, we're, we're pointing out that the, that the tight pre-initial before a uvular is the origin of the velar reading in the series. Okay. And now with, uh, uh, with labio uvulars, the voiceless velar fricative with a rounded vowel in middle Chinese is going back to a, uh, an aspirate labio uvular stop in old Chinese. In order to explain the velar stop in the mid middle Chinese, uh, we reconstruct this uh, tight uh, pre-initial C. I should have stated it more precisely. It's clear that generally speaking, uh, manner doesn't matter, right? So, so there's not going to be a separate phonetic for duck and a separate phonetic for tak. The Sheisheng hypothesis in the form I'm using it, which is the form that Baxter and Sagar are using it, comes from Li Fang Kui and says, for two things to be uh, in the same Sheshang series, they have to have the, let's say, the same nuclear vowel, 
the same code of consonant or no code of consonant uh, and a homoorganic initial. So that means a medial R can come and go, who cares? It also means that, that let's say, the tone, if you like, uh, but for us that means a, a final S or a final glottal stop can come and go. So, so you could have, you know, Bach and Prak written the same way, if you like, and you could also have, uh, you know, Pax uh, written the same way. Now, it tends to be that this doesn't happen for nasals, which is to say that Mach would be written with a different uh, phonetic. Uh, although uh, that's not kind of categorically the case. Uh, and then I would also say in bigger series, there are subseries that seem to be aiming at finer phonetic differences. So, um, so, so one thing that happens in a big series is you'll get a subseries for type A and a subseries for type B. Um, and uh, this is, so Maris Liss and I wrote a paper about kind of looking for this kind of phonetics, uh, like what, what, what are the phonetic details you get in subseries? And that was the only one that really popped out, but I, I think there's more to be done there. The more we work on this, then, then the less we will be able to uh, hold fast to the Shesheng hypothesis as uh, Li Fang Kui formulated it. Because what you'll end up getting is like, in, in, in many cases, fine phonetic detail will be in the, in, in the Shesheng series. Like, I mean, you also get, for example, you also get um, some Shesheng series where every character has the same tone, you know, where it's all uh, pox and, and uh, box and uh, prax with the S on it. But I think that everything works according to plan in a sense, right? You you come up with a very doctrinaire Shesheng series hypothesis. It it proves very productive in terms of figuring out what's actually going on, and then you can kind of let it go when when it's clear what is happening, which in some cases is even more strict than the Shesheng hypothesis, and in some cases is even more loose. And that seems to have to do with how many syllables of that type are in the language, right? Which is to say, like, um, um, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of tempted to make an analogy with poetry, right? Which is like, um, uh, if you're writing a poem in English, and uh, then you will, you know, you'll find it very easy to rhyme love with dove and above and whatnot, but then you'll find it very hard to rhyme things with orange. Um, so, so similarly, like when they had a lot of sort of, uh, words or morphemes, let's call them that had a similar phonetic structure, broadly similar phonetic structure, then the Sheisheng, uh, the, the use of the, the phonetic principle in the script allowed for more refined pronunciations. Whereas if it were a more rare syllable type, they they had to kind of it was economical in a sense to use one uh, phonetic for you know even for different nuclear vowels for example if we want to believe this syllabary story it would go something like this in the very early days you have some other story to tell and it's the kind of the story of how people invent scripts you you kind of haven't quite worked out any principles yet and and you start with pictures of concrete stuff you know you're like ah it's a dog you know and and it's a cat uh, and, and and then now you have the phonetic repertoire that you can start to build other things with anyhow that's the story in the early period and at that stage every uh, grapheme let's call it has a phonetic and a semantic meaning and and I don't want to say that necessarily graphically each character has, uh, oh, this is the phonetic and this is the semantic. No, no, no. Regardless of the graphic structure, in the early days, all signs were to use kind of Boltz's uh, terminology, plus P that's had a phonetic meaning and plus S had a semantic re meaning. Uh, well, eventually as you get to the kind of, uh, let's say late warring states period, it seems to be the case that um, the phonetic principle is predominating, 
which is to say that the that there are fewer cases of phonetic ambiguity and more cases of semantic ambiguity. And that's where you're sort of heading towards a real syllabary. Yeah. Uh, but then it seems like, uh, I mean, this is a kind of a, a just so story. I'm sort of telling you a parable, right? How close it is to reality is something that, that we need to, 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 to do a lot more investigation on. But then it seems like that process uh, of, let's say, de semanticization of the script was kind of uh, became a political question. Yeah, it became seen as some kind of decadence and uh, <laughs> and you know, ah, oh, the kids today they don't know how to spell anything. Yeah, so um, so around the Chin period, which is very short, right? When there was this effort to standardize things, although that's overstated, it's pretty clear now that uh, even the standardization of weights and measures was not as uh, successful as is sometimes talked about. But there clearly was some sort of political project of standardization. Uh, um, that, let's say, project from the Chin, whether or not it was successful in the Chin, sort of said, no, no, we need to, a Chinese character should have a phonetic and a, uh, a, a semantic component. And then um, eventually the kind of variation that you see in the Warring States period and this tendency towards uh, a, 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 a syllabary is sort of reversed. And you and you get kind of, it, certainly by the, the early Han period, and probably, yeah, well, let's say certainly by the, the early Han period, you, you get this, you know, the script as we know it today where like you are not allowed to play around with what goes on inside a Chinese character. Boltz is the person to look for on this stuff. And what I would uh, suggest, actually, which I guess I'll send out, is his article in the Brill Encyclopedia about the origin of the Chinese script. I'm not able to answer that, which is say, uh, like I've just been trying to draw attention to that as a question. But I would say that my impression is that Baxter and Cigar distinguish them. So, uh, which is to say, I mean, we would really have to look at the book very carefully. But my impression is that, like, uh, I mean, I'm not, let, let, I don't know about a given case, but let's say P dot R and PR. My impression is that, th that th those would have different outcomes in. Middle Chinese, uh, where you know what, what PR would be, you know, just P followed by a um, second division, yeah, and P dot R would be something like uh, an L initial. I've never had occasion to ask Baxter or Cigar exactly what they have in mind phonetically with this PR versus P dot R. I would think it would be very nice if the pre-initial initial distinction was was uh, merged or let's, let's you know, what Trubetskoy would say is you have some kind of, let's say, archiphoneme in that spot, um, or I guess archiphonetic position. Uh, <laughs> but, but anyhow, that, that then they should, they should, you know, if there was not a phonetic distinction, then they need to develop the same way and vice versa. If, if they don't develop the same way, then there must have been a phonetic distinction, yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that this is a kind of, um, uh, like, I, I don't want to put it too strongly, but let's say a rhetorical weak point in Baxter and Cigar's system, which is not to say that they've done anything wrong or that they're wrong about it, but I just feel like it could have been, uh, you know, that, that, that if you're a neo-grammarian like me and you read the book, you find yourself worrying about this problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although I will point out that, you know, uh, none of the reviewers worried about it. <laughs> um, and maybe that's because very few people operating in Chinese historical linguistics are neo-grammarian. Yeah, I, I don't have a strong feeling about that. But what I would say is that it points to something that I think needs uh, work that Baxter and Cigar have only kind of scratched the surface of, which they've done in another context, which is final R where whenever you have one of these dialect, very, you know, di you know, dialect split proposals, 
you you would really like to figure out um, you know which dialect, right? Like 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 um, let put put another way. Uh, dialect mixture is the kind of uh, an easy uh, rabbit to pull out of your hat. Like, you know, every time your historical phonology gets hard, you say, ah, it was dialect mixture. Now, I think that multiple readings of the same character with the same reading is a priori very good evidence of dialect mixture. But still, you, you want to say, like, where and when did the dialects split? Where and when did the dialects merge? And it, it, it may well be that in a given circumstance, you can't figure that out. There just isn't the evidence. But uh, you would want to see someone go through the effort, right? And as I said, in the case, which, which I haven't talked about at all, but in the case of final R, where there's a dialect difference, where in the West it changes to N and in the East it changes to Y, uh, Baxter and Cigar have, have, have great evidence of, oh, it happened you know, in this place at this time. So. I would just really like to see in all of these other cases, in, including this one, that some effort is put in to isolate you know, where and when this dialect uh, split happened. And, and then it will feel more like a genuine explanation and not, a, um, and not pulling a, a rabbit out of a hat. Now that's a sort of slightly different, that's answering a slightly different question than the one you asked, which is, you know, can, like if, if we have to invoke dialect variation, maybe dialect variation is enough and we don't have to distinguish uh, between uh, uh, these different phonotactic types of pre-initials. And I think that's an excellent point. Yeah, they, 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 we, we should only have as much machinery as we need and not any more. 